Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff with the Mississippi and the Civil War. Uh, this is a talk I had wanted to do back in November because it's on the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, which took place uh, November 30th, 1864. Unfortunately, I got busy and uh, being around the holidays, I didn't get as much done as I'd hoped. And so this took uh, quite a bit longer, but uh, I'm finally getting it done. But uh, this, uh, this is a uh, talk that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, for historians who study the Civil War, uh, some battles just have kind of a special meaning. And for me, one of those battles is Franklin, Tennessee. And in fact, uh, this picture here is a great uh, image of uh, the cotton gin at Franklin, where some of the fiercest fighting of the battle took place. But uh, the Battle of Franklin really sounded the death knell of the Army of Tennessee, an army that I had a number of relatives fighting in. So. Uh, it does kind of have a special meaning, uh, and this was a a battle that had uh, terrible consequences for the Army of Tennessee. Uh, there were five Confederate generals killed in the battle, including Patrick Claiborne, uh, who was considered one of the, the, the best uh, uh, commanders in the Army of Tennessee. The uh, uh, John Bell Hood, who had ordered the assault of uh, the Federal Works at Franklin with about 16,000 men, of that number, about 1,750 were killed, about 4,500 wounded. Uh, the five Mississippi brigades that fought at Franklin uh, were uh, just decimated. Um, in their book, uh, uh, Bobby Roberts and Carl Moneyhun uh, wrote, uh, they were, if you've never read it, their book, Portraits of Conflict, A Photographic History of Mississippi in the Civil War, which is an excellent book, I highly recommend it. But uh, they wrote about the Battle of Franklin and, he said, and they said, the Battle of Franklin proved the Army of Tennessee would still fight, but the senseless attack destroyed what remained of both the strength and the morale of the Confederate infantry. And I think that's a very accurate assessment of, of the impact that this battle had on the Army of Tennessee. So in this uh, episode, I want to uh, share with you an account written by a Mississippian who returned to the killing fields of Franklin, Tennessee, uh, well, long after the war, and uh, wrote about it. And he's, in his writings, he's really, I think, trying to make sense of, of everything that he had seen and, and the, the battle that really destroyed uh, uh, the army that he served in. And in June of 1897, William Wirt Thompson of Greene County, Mississippi, and this is this is him. This is kind of a, a beat up picture and torn a little bit, and but uh, this is this is a picture of him when he was serving in the Mississippi Legislature. But in June of 1897, he traveled to Nashville to attend the seventh annual uh, Confederate Veterans Reunion. And after the reunion ended, uh, Thompson uh, took a side trip to the nearby town of Franklin, Tennessee, to see where he had fought nearly uh, 33 years earlier. And visiting Franklin really stirred up a lot of memories uh, for Thompson. Uh, he had participated in the battle as the captain of Company A, uh, the Gaines Warriors uh, of the 24th Mississippi Infantry. He had seen his regiment and his company decimated in the battle. He himself was captured and spent the remainder of the war in a prison camp. So he really, uh, the, the Battle of Franklin had some uh, uh, very serious consequences for him and his, his regiment. And Captain Thompson uh, wrote an article about his trip to Franklin entitled simply uh, The Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, uh, which was published in the Pascagoula Democrat Star on September 3rd, 1897. And it's really an eloquent account by an old warrior uh, visiting the scene of his final battle. And uh, he wrote in his article, for a distance of nearly 20 miles, the railroad running south from Nashville passes down through a valley of surpassing beauty and loveliness. Nature has been wonderfully prodigal of her beautiful scenery all along those miles of valley and mountain, and the hand and taste of man has added much thereto. And this is a modern picture taken uh, uh, near the Franklin battlefields to give you an idea of the kind of, uh, of scenery that, uh, that Thompson was seeing as he traveled from uh, Nashville to Franklin. And he went on in his article to say, just where this great thoroughfare crosses the Archer River on the south side lies a high plateau 
almost level and surrounded on three sides by the picturesque little stream. Here, in this golden setting of fields of waving grain, sets the historic little town of Franklin, with its straight, clean bordered trees radiating out from a broad, well-kept plaza or open space, around which are arranged the handsome public buildings and offices of Williamson County, out of which Franklin is the county seat. Just south of the town and stretching away to the east and west in beautiful undulations, and with a valley in its midst, is another and higher plateau, while still further south on the horizon settles down a range of wooded hills, on the crest and near the center of which, clearly silhouetted against the evening sky, stands a tree alone, and higher than those nearby. To this tree, the citizen who may accompany you will point and tell you, that is Hood's tree. And this is an illustration uh, uh, taken from Battles and Leaders of the, the exact scene that, uh, that uh, Thompson is talking about, where uh, John Bell Hood uh, uh, witnessed, uh, overlooked the battle of uh, Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, Thompson goes on uh, to say, Bathed in the haze of a summer evening, this scene so calm, so lovely, so quiet and pastoral is so nearly a dream of heavenly loveliness that you could scarcely be made to believe that here, 33 years ago, was fought the bloodiest battle of the Civil War, perhaps the bloodiest ever fought on this earth. From that lone tree, a great Confederate commander looked down and watched his gray legions, the veteran remnants of the grandest army that the world has ever seen, as they charged across the valley and up the slope to where Thomas, the Rock of Chickamauga, with his trained and tried troops, stood waiting to receive them, with the river behind and on two sides of him, Thomas and his army were fighting for their very existence, while the flushed and victorious Confederates were rushing forward to strike what they finally believed would be a crushing blow, a blow they hoped would end the war and free their beloved Southland from the hated in invader forever. Now, uh, Thompson uh, uh, was probably aware of this, but uh, Tom General Thomas was actually not on the scene at the Battle of Franklin. He was uh, back in Nashville with the main army. The uh, Union general in command at the Battle of Franklin was uh, General Schofield. But uh, I love this uh, this scene. This is uh, some of the uh, uh, Tennessee infantry getting ready uh, to uh, 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 start their their march in, uh, uh, toward the, the federal works at uh, uh, the beginning of the Battle of Franklin. And then uh, Thompson goes on to say, "Man proposes, God disposes." From side to side of the beautiful valley, the tide of battle and carnage rolled, and from right to left, heroes uh, dashed on to death and fell at the old gin house and across the pike at the Carter house, and the bloody angle, destruction stalked supreme, and the demon of death held its highest carnival. Around that old gin, Missourians and Texans, Mississippians and Tennesseans, Alabamians and Arkansasers, all mingled in heaps together, and amidst them by Claiborne and Adams and Granberry, general and colonel and private, heroes all, no distinction, all glorious together. And again, this is another uh, shot of the the uh, uh, cotton gin at the Battle of Franklin, where some of the, the very bloodiest fighting of the entire battle took place. And then he goes on, Across the pike at the Carter House, on the bloody angle, lay the gallant straw, and piled three and four deep in the trenches were the veterans who in other days and in other battles had followed the peerless Walthall and Tucker to victory. Here on the fateful corner, the gallant ball planted the colors of the 24th Mississippi, and with his white, girlish hand on it, on its ribbon staff, lay with his face to the works, pierced with sixteen bullets, and beside him Captain Ben Toomer, the noblest Roman of them all. It was a battle of the giants, and nature stood aghast, while from his place by that lone tree Hood stood and watched his matchless soldiers melt away until the murky clouds of war and, and the smoke from the burning woods below covered the valley and shut it off from view. And uh, this is a modern photo of the Carter House that Thompson mentioned in his uh, in his reminiscence, which was uh, um, at the was there during the battle and was very badly damaged in some of the fighting that raged right around the the, the house. 
And then this is an illustration showing the Carter House from the backside, showing some of the outbuildings, which are again are, are terribly battle scarred. Uh, that and can still be those scars can clearly be seen today. But uh, Thompson uh, says, "33 years have come and gone, and the stranger who goes there now cannot imagine all this to have taken place amid the beautiful, peaceful scenes that now rise before him on every side." A dim line of yellow clay, almost level with the surface, is all that is left to mark the place where these bloody breastworks stood. And over this, over the Carter house a few short weeks ago, Irish potatoes were growing on a soil where 424 of Mississippi's best and bravest boys poured out their life's blood. A beautiful female seminary stands on the site of the historic old gin house, and nearby Missouri, mindful of her gallant dead, has erected a chaste marble monument to their memory. And just to give you an idea of the battle scars that these outbuildings hold, this is a view from the interior of one of those outbuildings. And all of these holes, these are bullet holes. This just gives you, I mean, just a, a, a visceral idea of just how fierce this fighting was around the Carter House. And uh, Thompson, uh, again, takes up the, the narration and says, Irish potatoes and gourd vines mark where Mississippians fell and other states have nothing. Can it be uh, that it is believed that the ingratitude and negligence fosters patriotism? If so, let the Southern youth visit Franklin today and grow patriotic. Greece has handed down through the ages, immortalized in story and song, her marathon and her Thermopylae, while other grandly historic names will go ringing down through all time. But Franklin, crowned with the heroism and washed in the blood of martyrs of human freedom, will find no place in the record, and no shaft will rise to perpetuate the memory of the Southern soldier there. It has been said that the Battle of Franklin was bad generalship and a mistake. It was neither the one nor the other. It was the inevitable, had Hood failed to attack Thomas here, the Confederate soldier could never have been made to believe that he had not lost his supreme opportunity and that a beaten, demoralized, and routed foe had been let slip from his grasp. It was the crowning wave of Southern valor, endurance and vengeance sweeping northward, that dashed its crest into the bloody foam on the breastworks of Franklin. And 16 days later, it was the undertow of defeat that drove it south again, beaten, vanquished, and discomfited forever. A fortunate coincidence carried us, myself and wife, down to Franklin on the morning after the, the closing exercises of the Grand Reunion at Nashville. Here we met the delegation from Missouri and received a generous and cordial welcome from a people as intensely loyal to the Southern cause as they were in the days when the storm of battle was raging around them. We were met and taken from the railroad depot in carriages out to and around about the battlefield and from there to the Confederate cemetery, a beautiful spot on a tree-crowned ridge. To this peaceful, lovely spot, these great-hearted people have removed at their own expense, are dead from their graves on the field, and marked each soldier's resting place with a neat headstone. Standing here under the trees and amidst these graves, Major Aiken, a gallant Tennessee soldier, said, We could almost wish that we too had been killed in battle so that we might be buried here. Here, George S. Nichols of Company B, 1st Tennessee Infantry, whose war record is written all over his honest, battle-scarred face, has stipulated that he shall be laid to rest when death's reveille sounds to call him home. And uh, this is a photograph of uh, the, uh, the cemetery. Uh, where the Confederate dead from the Battle of Franklin are buried. And uh, this photo was taken uh, in about 1866, so it's uh, very soon after the war. And this is a modern day photo. Uh, this is actually myself and two friends of mine. Uh, we're standing next to the Mississippi Monument uh, in the cemetery. Uh, this is marking the section of the, the cemetery where the Mississippians are buried. And in fact, there are more Mississippians buried in the cemetery than from any other state. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, Thompson said in his article, Mississippi, to her credit, this much may be said, has paid these people an ample measure for their care and trouble for her dead. But Mississippi alone, of all the old Confederate states, has done this. 
To these people it was a labor of love for the old Confederate soldier. They have asked no return, and they never will, but this does not discharge the debt of grateful remembrance that each state owes the heroes sleeping here. From the cemetery, the ridge slopes up to the residence of Mrs. John McGavick, and here too we were carried to pay a just and willing homage to one of the grandest women of the South, and were received with a gracious hospitality. On her wide veranda, she pointed out the spot where five Confederate generals lay dead at the same time, and her spacious hall and rooms were crowded with Confederate wounded, to whom she ministered with her own tender hands. The whole of that awful night, with a dauntless heroism, she remained in her house and saw Hood's gray and tattered veterans sweep through her yard and on down into the valley of death, and with a cheek unblanched and a heart unquailing, watched her southern soldiers dash up against the, the rock of Chickamauga. At one time, during the fiercest of the battle, Forrest dashed past her, through the hall and up the stairway to a portico on the second story, the most elevated portion of the battlefield, and there, through his glass, scanned the progress of the fight. What a glorious type of southern womanhood is this gentle, quiet lady. And uh, this is a modern photo of uh, Carton. Uh, the home still stands. Um, um, uh, Mrs. McGavick, uh, who was actually a native of uh, Natchez, uh, was there during the battle. In fact, the home uh, became a hospital for Southern soldiers after the, the fighting ended. And in fact, to this day, uh, you can see all over the floors uh, bloodstains from, uh, from all of the wounded that were sheltered in the, in the home uh, after the fighting. But uh, Thompson uh, went on to say, to touch her honored hand is the privilege of a lifetime. To see her smile is like catching a sunset ray from our glorious past and her fervent, God bless you, a benediction to receive which royalty itself might gladly bend the knee. From her house, along an avenue shaded by locust trees, we were carried to the home of her son-in-law, Lieutenant George L. Cowan, once a member of Forrest Escort. Lieutenant Cowan is a courtly gentleman of the old school, and under the trees around his pleasant home, his lovely wife, a worthy daughter of so honored and distinguished a mother, had spread a generous and appetizing collation to which we uh, did such ample justice as might have uh, been expected from hungry Confederate veterans. In this entertainment, Mrs. Cowan was ably assisted by such other charming ladies of Franklin as Mrs. Kincaid, Mrs. March, Mrs. Duke, and the lovely Miss Mary Nichols. After an evening spent, evening spent in this old Confederate soldier's home, we were taken back to the depot in time to meet the evening train for Nashville. We departed, leaving behind as kind wishes for our generous friends and carrying with us a pleasant memories that will mark this as the red-letter day of our life. Proud, Yes, prouder than ever that we had been a Confederate soldier and that we are still spared to be a Confederate veteran. W. W. Thompson, Leaf, Mississippi, August 20th, 1897. And uh, that's how uh, Thompson ended his, uh, his article. But uh, I did a little uh, research into the you know, life of Captain Thompson, and I found another interesting story uh, about him uh, concerning the Battle of Franklin that he doesn't even touch on in his article. And uh, this uh, uh, story begins uh, when uh, uh, Thompson was captured. And he was captured during the Battle of Franklin by Major H.M. Spain. And uh, this is uh, uh, the story. Uh, Captain Thompson of Company A, 24th Mississippi Infantry, who reluctantly gave up his sword, saying that he'd rather leave his dead body on the field than surrender it, uh, and was present with his company and had never been dishonored. Uh, the Major, Major Spain, uh, graciously promised that if both lived until the close of the war, he would return the sword. In 1874, Captain Thompson was elected a member of the Mississippi Legislature. He wrote the Adjutant General of Indiana for the Major's address. A correspondence ensued and in February 1874 they met and the battlefield promise was fulfilled. And this is the uh, map of the Battle of uh, Franklin from the, the Civil War Trust. They make some excellent maps. And uh, this shows uh, where the, uh, where the uh, uh, 
24th Mississippi was engaged. If you see the arrow here, they were part of uh, Brantley's brigade, and uh, they were taking part in the fighting over on the uh, far Confederate left. And uh, it was during this fighting that uh, Thompson was captured by Captain Harrison Milburn Spain, uh, who was provost marshal uh, in, the, uh, in an Indiana regiment. And the, the uh, uh, 24th Mississippi that, uh, that uh, Captain Thompson was a member of was, uh, I mean, you could justifiably say they were decimated at the Battle of Franklin. Uh, Captain Thompson's regiment had 18 men killed, 31 wounded, 14 captured, and one missing. And uh, among the captured, of course, was Captain Thompson himself, who spent the remainder of the war at Johnson's Island uh, Prisoner of War Camp in Ohio. He was released on June 17, 1865, and after taking the oath of allegiance to the United States, uh, Captain Thompson uh, went home to Greene County. He raised a family there, uh, eventually served in the state legislature for a time, and lived a relatively long life for that day and age, uh, dying at the uh, age of 62 in 1900. And he is buried in Leaf Cemetery in uh, Greene County, Mississippi. And this is a modern picture of his grave in uh, Leaf Cemetery. But uh, I really like these kind of reminiscences uh, where soldiers, you know, go back to the battlefields they fought on in their youth and really try and, you know, make some sense of, of everything they went through. Um, Captain Thompson, uh, I, you know, had been through hell, and I, you know that that battle and, and the others like it that he had fought in must have left scars with him, and you, you wonder how he dealt with the, with uh, all of those memories. Um, I think war always leaves scars on the men that have to fight, and it, it's interesting to see how they deal with it. And uh, this concludes my, uh, my uh, episode on the Battle of Franklin. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, please give it a, a, a like. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel and, and you like this kind of content, please subscribe because it really gives me an idea of just how uh, uh, how liked the, the material is and how often I should try and get out uh, new episodes. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them for me. I'd, I'd love to see them. And uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And I'll have another episode out uh, very soon. Uh, thank you.